we're in a new series. I'm so happy to be in a series. Like, and I'm excited about this one. You should have saw it this morning. This morning's crowd is a little bit more like subdued. Morning time, I haven't woken up yet. So I'm running around here like a bumblebee and they're just stagnant. It's, it was really a funny scene, like this guy is so excited. And I am. I was, me and Logan were walking to the shop and I was breaking down the series to him, man. I said, yo, son, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm going to be dealing with. And uh, he was like, Dad, when are you preaching this? Sunday morning. I went, yeah, it goes, oh, man. Because he's in, he's in children's church. I was like, are you feeling it, yeah? I was like, yeah, son. <laughs> we got to have a good time. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. Now, that's the text. This is the series. The series is called The Postures of God. As you read through the Bible, there are times where people get visions of God and his posture can be in different places. So there's times where God is seated. There's times where God is standing. There's times where God is walking. The last one was when, when he runs. Oh, that one could be a good one. And I've got a bonus track that I mentioned on Wednesday that just came to my mind on Wednesday, which is when the Lord rides his horse. Now, it's called the postures of the king because our God is a king. And so uh, we're going to look at week one, which is when he sits on the throne. The king on the throne. Before we read uh, the verse, there are some people who are very precious over what they would call their seat in church. I know no one here is like this. But over time, as they come and they come early, because if you come late, well, obviously afternoon is cool, but if you come late, the usher will tell you where to sit. Don't be arguing with usher about that's my chair over there. I want to sit over there. And so over time, they just they, they keep sitting on the same chair and it just starts to become in their mind their chair now I don't know how many times you have to sit on the same chair in the church for you to make it your own chair but they do it and 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 this is the thing if they ever had to turn up late and see someone else in quote-unquote their chair there is a silent violation that has happened within them like what are you doing I want to tell you in heaven God has his own chair. And I want to speak about what it means to see him seated on his throne from Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. Here is what the word of God says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the te- We're going to break down this text this afternoon. Let me bring this down a little bit. And so, first we must consider the significance of a throne. A throne is simply a physically elevated seat that is occupied by one who possesses great honor. The throne symbolizes authority. It symbolizes power and dominion. It is the seat of royalty. It is the symbol of a king's reign and a king's rule. It is the focal point. The focal point of a kingdom is he who is sat upon the throne. It was as great kings sat on their thrones in times past uh, that they would entertain the requests of their subjects or their citizens. Uh, They would make decrees. They would make decisions. Uh, They would dispense justice and judgment uh, at their throne. It is a seat of power. It is a seat of authority. It is a seat of influence. Our text comes in the year, or the context of our text, is in the year King Uzziah died. And so the one that previously occupied the throne is now gone. King Uzziah had a lengthy reign. It was around 52 years. When he ascended to the throne, he was but 16 years of age. They don't make 16-year-olds like that anymore who can rule an entire kingdom for 52 years. But now the king is dead. The son has set down, has set, sorry, on his reign in the year King Uzziah died. The throne that King Uzziah occupied was a temporal one. His expression of power and authority and sovereignty was limited. No king on assuming the throne could ever determine the length of his reign. He couldn't come up to the throne and say, well, I'm going to reign for 50 years. That that is out of his control because his his throne is limited in his power. No, no king ascending to the throne could ever 
uh, determine the amount of success he would have in his reign, if he would overcome his enemies, if he would prosper his people. He may have ideas, but the actual determination of that was outside of the remit of the power of his throne. There's only one thing that he could be assured of. There's only one thing that he knew was definitely going to happen, which is one day my reign is going to come to an inevitable end because it's a temporary throne. One day, as I ascended into my father's position, so my son or my daughter will ascend into my position. That's if the throne still exists. You consider its existence today. Since King Zedekiah suffered the captivity or the conquest of the Babylonians over Judah in 586 BC, there has not been a descendant of David who has sat on the throne in Israel. That throne physically and in its power and in its influence does not exist today. You see, the thrones of men, they do not last. When you consider the great dynasties of the past, where is Pharaoh's throne today? Where is their power and expression of influence coming out of Egypt? It is non-existent. Where is Caesar's throne today? Where's power coming out of Rome? What about the great rulers of Babylon and, and Persia and Greek? These are great empires that rule the entire world. Their thrones have no power. Their thrones have no significance. Their thrones are non-existent today because the thrones of men do not, do not last. When I went to India, I went to a place called Hyderabad. Now, this part of India was reigned over or ruled by the Persians. They were, they were called the Nizams. The Nizam of, of Hyderabad, now, these were kings that ruled over that region. And so when you enter into the fort, it's surrounded by these thick walls. You enter in it and you've got to go all the way to, to the top of this like small mountain. But it's very steep to get into the throne room. And so as we're walking up, I was told that the king would be carried up and down the steep stairway that kind of circled up onto the mountain top. And so, or the hill, the top of the hill. And there were these two men who carried them, and they have two tall and two short. So depending on whether he's going up or down, will depend on where they, you understand the situation, right? And so they would carry him, and I was thinking, man, like, I'm just, you just, you yourself getting up there is work. Imagine you carrying this king. And imagine, you know, he's, he's, he's coming up, and you go, oh, I forgot something, we need to go back down. <laughs> and so you get up to the top, and you enter into his throne room. And I tell you this, listen, man, there, there's, there's, it's just a historical place now. It's just a tourist destination. But there's still, you can see the way it's built, it's very intimidating. Like he's, he's literally high up above you. What is, what is see, what is see, it's like, I can't, it's like a wall. Probably like the size up to the ceiling and you're standing back and you can, you can imagine it in your mind's eye where he would be sat, all his guards and all his servants and his subjects. And you, you realize if you've been summoned before his throne, that you've got to understand your well-being is determined by what comes out of this man's mouth. But the reality is when I went there, there is no throne anymore. There's no power. There's no rule. There's no influence that comes from that room anymore because the thrones of men do not last. They're temporary. You see, there are many lesser thrones in life. King Uzziah had a throne, but it is a, it is a lesser throne. Pastor Brown, he was telling us at this pastor's conference, he's hired out this old church building where the Wolfham Forest Church used to meet. And there's another church that meet in there now. So he had to go in there to check something out or whatever. And he said that he saw that the pastor sits on a throne on the stage. Is that normal to you? You got, you got, you, if you visit that kind of church, or I don't know, he sits on the throne. Who is he, God? What kingdom do you, is this a kingdom or is this a church? Is this, for Jesus was the king of this church. The, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. So, uh, anyway, let me not get into it. Sit on the, could you imagine me sitting on the throne while worshiping? <laughs> come on. And then his wife has a throne here, so we're at the front. Okay. The king and queen come in. See, some of you didn't laugh out loud or was thinking, you know what, because you buy into this foolishness for yourself. There's something called, I call them birthday weddings. You ever heard of them? Where if you walked in, you would have thought, who's getting married? No, it's no one's getting married here. This is the soul's birthday. Oh, wow. And you know, you've got the princess, the queen. There she is, sat on a high table on her throne. <laughs> I tell you, people are crazy, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what people do. Weddings, they did. They sat on their throne. Them thrones mean nothing. 
Them phones, you could probably couldn't even afford the phone. Your big birthday celebration put you in debt. What kind of phone is that? Tell me. Let me, let me get back to my, my message because I don't want to upset nobody here. You can have your little phone. What I'm telling you is this, that there are real phones, real powers, real kingdoms that are not just associated with a monarch. There are thrones that exist on this earth that are seen and unseen. And here's the reality. Many of the seen thrones, and when I speak about a see, a seen, I'm speaking about a soul thing, a person, an entity that exerts power and influence in the earth. You can consider that a throne. That is that the seen throne, the person, the entity that has influence is empowered by an unseen throne an unseen entity. That's why the scripture speaks about principalities and powers. It actually in Colossians uses the word thrones. In Revelation, it speaks about Satan's throne. You can't see it, but he influences and empowers the things that you can see that influence people today. Oh, they're having a good time upstairs. Here's the reality of life. Why do I mind sharing this? Because everybody stands before a throne. Everybody comes before a throne. You choose which throne you will stand before you. You see, it's what you look to in life when you're going through things. It's, it's what you gain strength from. It's what you idolize, what you imitate, what you worship, what you revere, what you see as powerful or what you see as empowering. For some people, mammon sits on the throne that they stand before. It's money, it's financial wealth. They're continually before its throne. This is where I'm gonna, anyway, if you can teach me about how to get this, this is wisdom from this throne. This is my self-worth comes from this throne. My identity comes from this throne. There are others who have uh, beauty, sex appeal, relational attraction on the throne. I remember one time that uh, Pastor Mo, Sister Nicole, they were running like a youth student ministry and they had some debate here and they're talking about fashion and blah, blah, and extremities. And then one lady came, bless her consult. She's like, well, I just like to do my hair and do my makeup and put a little skimpy dress. Cause, not because I'm trying to get anyone's attention, <laughs> but because I want to feel good about myself. I want to feel empowered. Is anyone here eating that nonsense? You stand before a throne. And you believe that's what empowers you? Well, so I don't need to tell her, we're all getting older. <laughs> the Bible says that beauty is fleeting. I only can preach the Bible to you. I'm sorry if I'm breaking your little bubble. This is the right. That's where you're getting your wealth from? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna waste your money. Try, let me just back up. Pastor Leon, back up, back up. You just came back. Relax, man. Chill. Like, people stand before you. Position, status. Popularity, secular success. Some people have ideologies on the throne. Marxism, socialism. They believe these ideologies are infiltrated in society and that's gonna fix all of our problems. They're lesser thrones. They're temporal. Their power is limited. The atheists and materialists do this because they do not recognize that there is a divine being that sits on a seat that has authority and power that the universe must answer to. And so they relegate themselves to that which is temporal. The humanist is different. The humanist believes that there is a throne, but they believe that they're the one who is to sit on it. The question is, what throne do you come before? To where do you look in times of need? Who is the greatest influence and expression of your life? Where is your devotion centered on? Where do you draw strength from? What are you empowered by? King Uzziah had a throne but it was a lesser throne, and there are many who would stand before it. But the reality is, is Uzziah is now dead. It had its limitations. It was temporal. It was for a time. The Bible says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And so this is amazing. So he's looking at Uzziah's empty throne, and he's sad. But at the same time, he looks up and he sees a heavenly throne. So he was moved by the lesser throne, but God's given him revelation of a greater throne in heaven. And, and it's, it's God's throne. In the year the earthly king died, Isaiah saw the heavenly king. The Bible makes it clear in the text that there is a throne in heaven on which the king of glory 
resides. Now, I painstakingly have been studying the word for you. It's okay to break down the significance of the flow, right? It's power, expression, royalty. All of these things are important. And so he says, man, King Zao was a decent king. He was. But there's a greater king. There's a higher king. There's a more powerful king. One of the most frequent postures of God in heaven is him sat on the throne. I, Psalms 11 verse 4 says this the Lord is in his holy temple the Lord's throne is in heaven his eyes behold his eyelids test the sons of man it is a heavenly throne his throne is in heaven I saw him high and lifted up which means that his throne exceeds and excels and is greater and is higher than any other throne that is established uh, on earth. Uh, it, is, it is the throne in which there is no higher appeal. You know, you can go to magistrates, then you can go to crown, then you can go to, to, to high court, or in America it would be called the Supreme Court, where the highest appeal is to God himself. Uh, there is no greater authority than God himself. Uh, this is supreme sovereignty. Psalms 103 and verse 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. All that means he is preeminent over everything. There is nothing outside of God's jurisdiction, his province, his district, his parish, his borough, his area, wherever you feel. You know, you got a governing thing like the, the labor, um, labor, um, the council have jurisdiction over Wolverhampton, right? That's their jurisdiction. The prime minister has jurisdiction over the United Kingdom to certain extents. You understand what I'm saying? The European Union, they try and take it over the whole. God's jurisdiction is all of creation. Preeminent over everything. Lamentations 5.19 says, You, O Lord, remain forever. Your throne from generation to generation. It's an eternal throne. That means no one succeeds him. There is no, the king is dead. Long live the king when it comes to God. You know, I, it's only me who sits on this throne. There is none before him, there is none after him. He, this is the ultimate seat of judgment and justice. Psalms 9 and verse 7 says, But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. All reckoning, or justice, or righteousness and truth is found at the throne of God. My deeds are before him. My thoughts are before him. The intentions of my heart is before him. The Bible says in Revelation 20 verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. You can't run from this throne. You can't hide from this throne. This throne is just truth. You remember the scripture says, Many will come to me and be like, Lord, Lord. Hallelujah, praise the name. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Power, kingdom, anoint. Ah, he says, yeah, yeah, you who practice lawlessness. This throne you can't play church with. This throne you cannot be religious in front of. This throne will expose the truth. Why are they running? Because they see themselves food for, for who they are, before a holy and righteous God who sits on his throne. They run. There's people who say, when I stand before God, well, I'm going to say this, and why is this, and why is that? You're going to say nothing. You're going to run, you're going to try and hide, and you're going to find no place to run and no place to hide. The references of God's throne in Scripture convey this overwhelming supremacy. He has all authority and all power. He is holy. He is glorious. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up. Can we zoom a little bit into Isaiah, into this moment? He sees God on the throne in a very difficult time. When you consider the context of the vision, the prophet may have been depressed, he may have been anxious, he may have been discouraged because a great leader of Judah is no longer on the throne. Now you've got to understand, this is quite down the timeline of succession of kings. So when you read the book of Kings, you read 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you realize that not every succession was a smooth one. Not every succession means that things are going to continue exactly how they were. Sometimes the son didn't have the father's heart and then 
the nation will turn and, and, and bad things will start to happen. And so you can understand if he's a bit anxious in this moment. He's been, man, we had 52 good years. I know Uzziah at some point got a bit prideful and God had to humble him. But for the most part, there's no idolatry. There's no paganism, man. Like, he, he did all right. This was, this was pretty solid, stable leadership. Uh, and now we're in a transition and we're not sure how things are going to work out. Plus, he's dead. We've lost our king. In the year where the crown monarch went down into the dust and the darkness of his tomb and all the pomp and all the pageantry which surrounded him had dissolved and disappeared. The Bible says Isaiah saw another king. He saw a king immortal. He saw a king that was all wise and all powerful sitting on a throne which is forever and ever and ever. God is showing Isaiah that though Uzziah may not be on his throne, I still am on my throne. And he is high and lifted. He saw God. He saw God in his glory. He saw God in his wonder. He saw God in his splendor. Think about it in a dark season. In a dark moment. Can you see God in the dark times of life? It is all good if you can see God in the good times. Bless your cut and suck. I'll even give you a hand of round of applause. But the reality is most people can see God when things are good. When you're blessed and everything is wonderful and your health is good and everything's in your life is peace and prosperity. And yeah, and one, you're loving those sermons. It's your season, it's your time, it's your breakthrough, it's your it's your break, whatever you know. I'm running out of words. They give, they give it. You're like, yes, yes, it's mine, it's mine. Because everything is rosy in your life. And so, yes, God is lifted up. Oh, yes, he's wonderful. Yes, I'll come into church and I'll lift my hands and I'll sing to him. But the question is, in the darkest hours of life, in the hardest times, in the most difficult times of life, is he then still enthroned? Is he then lifted up? Is he seated high and above all, everything, um, all and everything else? Because I'm telling you, in that moment, moment is when you need to see him the most. I need to see the Lord seated on his throne when I'm going through things. When things are not good, when times become dark in my life. Because if, that, if I can't see him, then all I'm going to see is the earthly thrones. All I'm going to see is the temple glory. If all he saw was Uzziah's throne, then yes, he is in trouble. Yes, be stressed out. Yes, be anxious because you really don't know what's going to happen. Everything about your life is going to be determined by the man who is going to succeed Uzziah. If all you can see is an earthly foe. But if there is someone higher, then hey, this guy could be crazy, but I know I serve a greater king. I know there is someone who is higher than this king who is in control. Many people, all they see is the earthly and the temple when they go through things. Tell you, we live in an age where more people are depressed than ever before. Full of anxiety, full of anger, disillusioned, upset. There are people protesting in the week every single, every, 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 people are protesting every single week. I don't know why that was so hard for me to get out. Right on the streets. Because they looked at temple phones consumed with conspiracy. My dad, I've never known such a, cons I'm only 40. I've never known such a conspiracy theorist age ever. The internet has jacked some people up, man. Every little thing you look at, you can't eat nothing. <laughs> you know, you know, that's got that in there. And that's good. Yeah, you can't, you don't eat nothing. Just, just breathe air. <laughs> this, this is the age we live in, man. Why? Because you know what? You can't see a throne above. That's why you're consumed in all of this stuff. This is why I'm telling you, man. Consumer. The other day, I was, I'm driving, I saw this house. It had labor at the front of the window, covering the whole entire top floor window. You know, you got the thing with the stick when you're selling the house, they got labor on it. Labor, labor. you think Keir Starmer? Is that, is that the phone you stand before? You really think he has all power, authority to really help you in your life? This is, this, is, this is what people look to. Because they see no throne above. And so when the, earthly thrones fell, they fall apart. When, when the earthly throne shows its weakness, they become weak. When the earthly throne becomes unstable, they begin to lose their minds. 
he saw God lifted up in a dark and an uncertain time. You know, Isaiah is not the only one to have a vision of God in his throne room. You know, there's others. There's others. Can we look at them? You might know them, some of the other people. Okay, here's the first one. The prophet Micaiah, that was the one that was on the top of your list, wasn't it? Micaiah, Micaiah, you, you, Micaiah, Micaiah saw God. Okay, look at this. First Kings 22, verse 19. Can we put these up? <coughs> then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord. Oh, he saw the Lord. Sitting on his throne. And all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand on his left. So the prophet Micaiah had a vision of the Lord and he's seated on his throne. Daniel had one as well. Can we show Daniel's one? When Daniel says, says he says, I watched till thrones were put in place. See, there's, less, there's lesser thrones. Even in heaven, there's lesser thrones. And the ancient of days, that's God, was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire. He saw the throne of God. The last one is John. Let's show John in Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. He says, After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, Come up here and I will show you things that must take place after this. And then look at what it says in verse 2. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. You know what's interesting about all those moments? They all saw God high lifted up on the throne in difficult times. Micah was standing amongst a multitude of false prophets and two corrupt and wicked kings when he saw God on his throne. Daniel saw God on his throne when, when the children of Israel, where Judah specifically, were in captivity in Babylon. John saw God on his throne when he had suffered persecution and tribulation and had been banished to the island of Patmos. The revelation didn't come in the good times. The revelation came in the difficult times. The revelation came when things were hard in life. The revelation came when they had questions that nobody can give them answers to. It was when they were in their trial that God revealed himself to be seated on his throne high and lifted up. God had to make it clear to them, and he's making it clear to us, that the conditions of earth, the conditions of your life, the conditions of the seasons that you're going through right now do not reflect my position in heaven. Because I'm dealing with stuff down here doesn't mean that God's up I don't know, man. What should we do? What should we do? I don't know. I don't know. No, no. He says, I'm ruling and reigning. Now, you can be real cynical about this now, what I'm saying. So I'm going to entertain the cynicism. The, cynical, the cynic is this. I'm going through some serious stuff right now. Serious stuff. I've lost a loved one. I've got terminal sickness. Just came back from the doctors. They said, I've got stage four cancer. I'm talking real stuff in life. God seated in heaven. In glory. Come on, the seraphim are flying around him. Holy, holy. The elders, lesser thrones, cast their crown down and they begin to. But here I am in the darkest moment of my life. I'm going through it. So the cynic is hey, well, God is good for you. you you're having a good time on your phone. But down here, I understand, okay, it's not affected. In, yeah, but down here, I'm dealing with this. That's the cynical response. No one's like, man, that's true. What do we do now? So here's the reality. If there's nothing greater above what we're facing in life, then we have no hope. Don't worry, I'm going to stay on this for a minute. I'm going to ask, ask a question and I'll answer it properly. If there is nothing, because that's your other option. There is no God. It's the atheists, the materialists. There's no God or no throne and no heaven. You know what they do? They point to all the bad things in life and say, well, if there was, why is there this and this and this? So I say, okay, so if that's not happening, then all I'm left with is this then. What I'm facing is all I have. This is the situation. And there's no throne on earth that is powerful enough to influence this situation. There's nothing greater. And so what are you going to do? You're just going to look to lesser things? That's what the world does. They look to lesser things. And so I go to this and I do this and, you know, 
this therapy and therapy is not evil or whatever. You know, and I've got this and, you know, I'm going to inject my face and I'm going to, you know, people, I'd say most people, they can't even sleep at night. They have to take all kind of tablets, all kinds of stuff. Where, where are you going to look to? If there is no throne above, think about it. I broke down what the throne means, no power, no, no authority. If there's no higher dominion, if there's nothing that's able to, outside of what I'm going through that can influence it, then I literally have no hope. There's nothing there. I spent time in the Word of God, and I was like, oh my days. Like, so Lord, why? Why do you show them this? This is to show them that there is hope. Well, let's, let's spend a bit more time. If there is a throne above, and there is, it's actually an encouragement that God is seated on a throne, high and lifted up, and has power and authority and dominion over everything that you would face in life. It's only encouragement, though. If you're going through this, and the one who is high and lifted up is your king. If he's not your king, then I give you every right to be angry. But if that is your king, better yet, if this is my father, if this is my savior that is sat on the throne and he is greater than what I'm facing, he is greater than what I'm dealing with, he is more powerful than what is coming against me. Though it overcomes me, it cannot overcome him. Then this is, this is, this is important to me. I need to, in this moment, be able to find God. See him, sit on the phone. I need this, this is so important now. Okay, I'm going through stuff, man, but God's on the phone. But I need to be able to see it. I need to be able to see it. I need to be able to know it. This is gonna be real to me. Can I give you the answer why? Can I give you the answer why? Okay, see, this is why I love this book. Oh, I love you. Me and the Bible having a moment right now, forget you guys. I love, this book is serious. This book is so great. Let me show you why it's so great. Because here's, can we show the scripture? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Ah, oh, look at it. Oh, look at it. It's so beautiful. It's not beautiful. The idea is beautiful. It's the best thing I've seen all day. Let us, therefore, therefore, because you go through stuff. The Bible ain't lying to you. The Bible's always going to be true to you. Because you're in a dark moment. Because you're going through things. Because things are hard. Let us, the Bible's encouraging us. Therefore, come boldly. You, listen, man, I'm going to behave myself in heaven, you know. I hope you know that. If you're in my way and the phone is there, you're in my way, I'm pushing you over. You can hate me for all eternity. I don't be, I'm like, I'm getting to the throne. Boldly. That means God could be holding office, like, with angels and doing some of the talking. Boom! I just bust through the door. Dad! Father! Father! No, no, this is what's going on, you know. No, no. And he will stop everybody else because he says, oh, it's my son. My son, I want him to come before me like this. He says, come boldly before the throne. Oh. And then now look how it describes the throne. The throne of grace that we may obtain. Obtain. So what's here can be experienced down here. That's why I need to see it. Because he says, here there's grace. Here there's mercy. That means you may be in a dark thing down here because you put yourself in it. But I got a throne of grace and mercy. Then I can come before it boldly and I can obtain what is here down in my situation. That we may find grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. When? When? Okay, now when you need to see him. In the time of need. In the time of of need. This is the, f listen man, this is the throne you need to live before. This is the throne you need to stand before. I can approach it. My voice, when I pray in the morning, comes before that throne. My voice comes before that throne. My voice literally goes up and it comes before the throne of God. My strength comes from that throne. I am empowered by the power that comes through that throne. Tell you, people are proud because you, you empower because you look good today? That's a whack power, man. I need some real power. I need to go before the throne of God. That's the power I need. I'm dealing with, imagine you're dealing with some crisis in life. You think that you just do your hair and do some makeup and that's going to be like, I'm like, no, my cousin's fighting for his life in hospital. Looking good and empowering me. I need to go before the throne of God. I told you I get a little bit excited in this sermon. My vindication comes from that 
throne. I receive wisdom from that throne through life. I summon the expression of power that proceeds from that throne by command. For my Lord and Savior, the one who sits on the throne says, when you pray, pray like this, thy kingdom come. The focal point of the kingdom is what? The throne. I said that earlier. The kingdom, the power of the throne, come. I'm in the situation, that kingdom come. Then he makes it even more specific that he's speaking to his throne. Thy will be done. Because decisions are made from the throne. I pray his kingdom power. I pray the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. This is why I need to see this throne. This is why I need to live before this throne. This is the throne that I stand before. See, the enemy wants to make you lose sight of it. He will have you stand before every other throne in life, but not before this one. Because this one's actually the throne that's going to help you. It's seeking God. It's seeking his face that's going to see you through. Breakthrough, deliverance. These things come from the throne of God. Look at it. I'm telling you, the Bible sweet me. It sweets me. It just, it gets me excited. I get excited. I really do get excited. Look at the scripture here. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Oh, oh look at it. Like the answers are found here. This is what I'm saying. I'm not trying to give you like some kind of linguistic type. Oh yeah, all that made sense. No, I'm just showing you what the, the answer is here. If you were raised with Christ. Oh, you read it. Hallelujah. Seek those things which are above. Well, what's above? Well, heaven's above. No, no, no. We won't get specific on this one. Where Christ is. See yeah, where Christ is up there. No, 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 no. Let's get more specific. Sitting at the right. He says, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't be consumed in this. You were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Seek those things which are above. It is from above that you are sustained. That's why the scripture says, lift up your eyes to the hills. It says, lift up. Your help comes from above. Redemption comes from above. Miracles come from above. And so when I'm going through stuff, I need to see God lifted up above my situation because I know I have, I'm connected to the one who sits on the throne. You have a king that reigns forever over every circumstance. Ah, uh, I'm trying to just put boldness into you. I saw this some messages that you just come before his throne. You come before it consistently. You come before his throne confidently. You come before his throne in boldness. Psalms 29 verse 10 and 11 says, The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. You've got to see God seated on his throne. Before his throne, we stand with humility. We stand redeemed. We stand with purpose. Recipients of his mercy and grace. This is more than just a thought and a saying. You know, you go through things, well, God is on the throne. Here we have Christians say that. God's on the throne. All right. You better understand the significance of that throne to realize how much you need to get before it because you need the one who sits on it. And he's the only one who's able to influence your life and what you face. So I bring this to a conclusion. My concluding thought is that Jesus is on the throne. Ah, oh, he's on the throne. Hallelujah. The only reason why I can have access to it. You've got to understand, outside of Christ, it's just, like the, you're in the darkness. You don't even know there's a throne. <laughs> you may, if you get a glimpse of it, you better turn to it. I have access to God's throne because of Jesus. He sits on the throne. He sits on the throne. It's amazing. Ah, it's incredible. The one who washed the feet of the disciples. God, this is the king of glory. You gotta understand, the angels sing my name. Not my name, Leo's name, Jesus. I'm talking like I was, you understand? He says, he is. Jesus says, oh my days. Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 12 and verse two. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was sat before him endured the cross, despising the shame, oh, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, this is this is this is this is this part mystery. So, no, it's part. No, it's not actually mystery. It's saying because the right hand speaks of the power 
right hand always speaks of the power. God, that's why the Bible speaks about my righteous right hand, okay? But, but John actually gets, in reading Revelation, where, where he speaks about the seal, the scroll that's sealed up with seven seals. You know your Bible, verses chapter 4, 5, and 6, and 7, okay? You can read it in your time when you go home. And, and he says, I saw him sitting on the throne. So he speaks about him, which we read. But then he says, I saw as a, a lamb, as if it was slain, but is now alive. Speaking of Jesus, on the throne, in the midst of the throne, on the one who sat on the throne. So he's, he's like the triunity of God. He's trying to explain it. I'm his deep. And he said, because the, the lamb gets up, Jesus gets up and takes the, f- the scroll out of the father's hand. Though he is one with the father, he is distinct from him. He sits with him and he starts to open it and he begins to read it. So you've got to consider this. Before all things, Jesus is on the throne. Philippians 2 says that he did not consider it equally robbery to be equal with God. He's on the throne. But the scripture says that he made himself like us. He humbled himself. That's what the prior to that verse says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And then it goes into it and say that he made himself of no reputation. He had the most supreme and sovereign reputation and he made himself of no reputation. So you gotta consider it. This, this whole series is the gospel, by the way. I hope you see it. You should have saw it from the time you got the image and said, oh, this is the gospel. That the one who's seated on the throne got up. Now, remember, you're going to see, you go, go home and do your own study. Many times God is seated. So for God to get up, it's not because, ah, I'm just trying to stretch my back. <laughs> I'm going to sit back down. When God gets up, it means something's about to happen. Like, oh, he's going he to get up again and when he comes back. That's when the whole heaven goes, oh, my day, like, today's the day. And so there's a time where he got up. God stands, that's next week. Got up. And all the heaven would have stopped. Like, what he's getting up. And then he took off all his glory. And he came down. He was sat, he stood, then he came down. You know what he did? He walked with us. Oh, my days. Jesus walking with us, man. He lived. And then he died for us. The one who sat on the throne, his back rests on the throne. But now his back is lacerated. The Bible, what does he say? When, when David wants to make a, a, a temple for him, you want to make a temple for him? He says, heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. But it's those same feet that are pierced as he's knelt onto a cross. The same hands of God that would have sat on the throne. They now have holes through them because he's being crucified for our sins. He dies, but death couldn't hold him down. Why? because he's the one who sits on the throne. <laughs> you better recognize. Just because I'm not seated, don't mean I still have that power. That phone only has power because I sit on it. And so he tells death, you need to move now. The disciples thought once they put him in the tomb that that was it. That's why they were hiding. But they didn't realize it's the one who sat on the throne that said he would rise again. So if he says he's going to rise again, then he's going to, he's going to rise again. As sure as he is about his resurrection, as sure as he is about any other promise of God. That's why you need to trust in the promises of God. His word does not return back to him void. Oh, I'm preaching, but I need to wrap the sermon up. And so he rises again, throws death off. Just tells us, move. That's like, hey. <laughs> Walks out the tomb, shows himself to 500 people, sits down with his disciples. And you know what comes? Comes a time where he sends back up. And they watch him. They're gazing at the ascension of Christ. I love this moment in the scripture because the angels are like, what are you man staring at? Get over what he told you to do. <laughs> That's funny. He ascends back up. And I believe all of heaven would have stopped because the king has returned. And he came with his own blood. He presents it to his father. And then he sat back down on his throne. But now we have access to it. He's purchased and redeemed our access to it. Because he understands in this life, you're going to go through some stuff. He went through some stuff. And so I realized, yeah, 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 yeah. The doors are open now. Come anytime you please. But can I tell you, it gets sweeter. Ah, oh, it gets sweeter. I'm concluding, but I was, I was, I'm telling you, I was studying this thing. I was getting excited. <laughs> Just studying my, I was like, oh my days, like, Lord, like, this is good. Like, okay, look, look, look what he says. Before he left us, he gave us this promise. John 14, verse 3. Let me show you this. And if I go and prepare a place for you, oh, he's coming back. 
Oh, I love you, Jesus. Come back today. I will come again and receive you to myself. Oh, they're sweet. Look at it. That where I am, there you may be also. So he says, don't worry. Through this life, I've got you. Uh, this is where, this is who you talk to. You got to understand who loves you, who died for you, who has a plan for you, has a purpose for you, who will strengthen you, who will encourage you, who will give you wisdom. It's me who sits on the throne. It's me. Isaiah saw him lifted up, but Isaiah, at that point, it's progressive revelation. The Bible's progressive revelation. He didn't know him the way I know him because he didn't realize that that same one would die for him. But anyway, he, said, he says, this is through life. Live before my throne. Come before my throne. This is, this is important. But you have to understand, the real reason why you need to see it as well when you're going through stuff is to realize that what happens in this life is not the end all and the be all of your existence. That the reality is that where I am, you will be with me also. Oh, I'm going through things. I need to see where God is. Because I know he's coming back for me. Now, let, let's show, can, can I give you a glimpse of the fulfillment of it? I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm done after this. Revelation 7 and verse 9. Oh, my days is so good. Look. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one can number. A lot of people. A lot of people getting saved. A lot of people in heaven. Of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Oh, we got pause there. So Nigerian people are in there. <laughs> Ghanaian people are in there. Zimbabwean people are in there. Zambian people are in there. South African people are in there. Uganda people are in there. I don't know why I'm staying in Africa. Indian people are in there. Chinese people, Taiwanese people. Oh, you better believe Jamaica. There are plenty of Jamos. Plenty of Jamos in there. I know how we stay, but we up in there. St. Lucian people in there. Grenadian people, Guyanese, Brazilian, American, English, Polish, Bulgarian, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, Russian, Norway nation, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Where are they? Where are they? This is why I the Bible. So good. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Oh, my dripping go white. We all just white, white, white. White rose, palm branches. I don't know where I'm so. I'm so, finding myself with a palm. <laughs> I never know who I am. <laughs> I'm telling my palm branch. Hey, listen, man. I'm going to be having a good time in heaven. Oh, you're going to see my man have a good time. You'll be like, man, possibly never see you smile so much. I'll say, I know. <laughs> I'm, smiling. I'm still smiling, man. I'm like, that's where we are with him on his throne. And so what I'm saying is, when you're going through things and when you're facing things, and I, I, I don't have to as much preach to you on how to deal with and negotiate good times in life. I think you're pretty good at that. I try to equip you through the seasons of life that can be a bit more difficult. I need to live before and stand before his throne now as I will then. That the enemy don't know how to do with that. That why are you still praising God? Why are you still going to church? Why are you still waking up in the morning to talk to, talk to you? Can't you see what I'm doing in your life? Can't you see the crazy? No, 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 because this is where I stay. You can't switch this on and off. You can't be so consumed in this life and then think when things are, I'm going to really start focusing there. No, you stay before his throne. As I was going through a difficult time with the whole entire nation, King Uzziah is dead. It may have been a tough year for him. It may have been a tough year for you. But the scripture says, in that year, there came a moment where I saw the king of glory. And oh, he was high and he was lifted up. He was seated on the throne. Live before this throne. Come before this throne. Never lose sight of this throne. May he be enthroned in your heart and in your life until you be with him or until he returns in his glory. Make sure as you negotiate this life uh, that you see the Lord high and lifted up, uh, seated on his throne because you have access to it. Let's buy our heads, let's close our eyes in respect to God.